light mix. Another new feature related to lighting is the new light mix feature, which allows you to adjust the lights in your scene even after you render. First, open up the asset editor and go to the render elements tab. Then right click and add a light mix render element. If you expand the right flyout panel, you can choose whether you want to group the lights individually, which is similar to this list here. Or you can group by instances, layers, and light IDs. I would just leave it as individual lights. Now you can render your scene as normal. When your render is finished, you'll see a list of layers on the right side of the VR frame buffer window in the compositing section. Now select the source light mix layer, and you'll see all of the lights within this mix. This is where you can see the true power of the light mix feature by turning on and off each light. You can see that the scene updates immediately. You can also interactively adjust the brightness of each light by dragging these arrows up and down or type in a specific value. Another cool feature is that you can click here to change the color of your light. You can see that not only does it change the light, but it also changes how the light affects the surrounding objects. When adjusting the light mix, you should consider saving the preset to a file in case you need it later. This will allow you to create different lighting scenarios very easily. And in the future, you can use this button to load the light mix presets. If there are multiple light mix presets in one folder, then V-Ray will automatically load all the presets here. Once you are done adjusting the light mix settings, you can export the image as normal, or you can send the light mix to composite. This will break them into layers, which you can use to composite further using the new V-Ray frame buffer window. This takes me to the next new feature, Velvet Material. You can easily create micro fiber fiber materials such as velvet and satin using the new sheen options. Here I have a chair with a normal fabric material applied to it. Let's start the interactive render to see how it looks. To use the sheen options, first click here to toggle the advanced settings. Now scroll down to the sheen options. Here you will see the sheen color and the sheen glossiness. You can choose the color for the sheen layer using the color picker here. I would set it to a light blue color in this case. For the sheen glossiness, a value of 1 means that the sheen effect is not visible. On the other hand, if the value is lower, then the sheen effect is more noticeable. I would set it to 0.8. And that looks good. For a more realistic looking sheen color, let's copy our diffuse map and paste it here in the sheen color. Now right click and wrap it in a color correction texture. Then we can use it to brighten up the texture. Now let's compare the before and after. You can see that it looks more like a fabric material now. One trick that we can use to further enhance this material is by importing a quench map to the sheen glossiness slot. As you can see, with the quench map, this fabric material now looks more like velvet. You can also adjust the grunge map further so that there's more contrast on the velvet material. You can choose whether you want a subtle or a more pronounced effect. And here's the comparison before and after. It can look even better under different lighting. Also, remember to save this material after you're done so you can use it later. Fix material tiling. Material tiling is another common issue. This usually occurs when the material repeats over a large face that is bigger than the texture size. Here you can see that our material looks really good up close, but the further we zoom out, the clearer we can see the tiling issue. To fix this, go to the diffuse map, and down in the texture placement, change the type to mapping source. Then in the UV placement source, add a new UVW placement. Next, go down to randomization, and enable stochastic tiling. There we go. You can see that the stochastic tiling parameter can help you achieve a non-repeatable look by randomizing the texture mapping in each tile. With this method, no matter how big your surface is, there will still be no visible tiling issue. Material randomization. Material randomization is a trick that I like to use to create color variation in my material. To start, select the material that you want to use, then right-click, wrap in, multi-sub. Here you can choose where to get the ID from. 
we can try random by face material ID. Now we can use these sliders to tell V-Ray what to randomize. But as you can see, in this case, it's changing all of the wood planks at once, so let's try a different mode. Random by no name seems to work pretty well. Now we can go back to these sliders and adjust them so that the color doesn't vary too much. A subtle change can make it look more realistic. There we go, that looks good. Colorized materials. When using a material, you might want to change the color of it to match your design. There are two ways to do that. One is you can select the material and go to the edit tab in the SketchUp material editor, then use the color picker to give it a tint. You can see that it changes the color in the SketchUp viewport, but it doesn't show up in the interactive render. However, you can restart the render and you will see it updated. There we go. Now if you want to undo the changes, then you can click here to reset it to the default color. And like before, you might have to restart the render to see the update. The other way to colorize a material is to use color correction. To do that, right click on the diffuse map of the material, select wrap in, color correction. This will place your diffuse map inside a color correction texture. Now you can use these sliders to change the color of your material. As you can see, this method doesn't show up in the SketchUp viewport, but it will be updated live in the interactive render. Just repeat this process for any material you like. The reason why I like using the color correction more is because you can use it for any map. For example, you can use it on the reflection and glossiness map to change how reflective or glossy the material is. Pretty cool, huh? When applying materials to your objects, it's important to apply the texture at the right scale. The texture is being too small or too big can make your render look unrealistic. Here you can see that the flooring texture is too small. To know the typical dimension of a specific material, you can search for it online like so. Or you can reference real life material around you. To fix it, just go to the SketchUp Material Editor and use a sample tool to pick the material. Now we can go to the Edit tab and increase the dimensions of that material here. Let's zoom out and measure the width of the wood plank using the Tape Measure tool again. It's around 7 inches now, so that's more realistic. In this case, this scene was modeled after a real project and in the original photo, the planks of the wood flooring seems to be pretty wide, so I will make it a little bigger. There we go, that looks good. Texture binding. Sometimes you will have a material that looks really small in the render. And when you go to change the scale, you cannot do it because there's no map in the texture slot. And sometimes the material doesn't even show up in the SketchUp viewport. To fix this issue, you need to use the texture binding. First, go down to texture binding and make sure it is turned on. For the mode, here you will see three options. Custom, where you can paste a custom map as a binding texture. Texture Helper, which is basically a typical map that V-Ray creates for you to represent the scale. And the Auto Mode, which will tell V-Ray to automatically search for a map inside of the material and use it as a binding texture. Usually I like to use the Custom Mode, where I can copy the diffuse map and paste it as an instance in the texture slot. This way, whenever I change the map here, the binding texture will also change. Remember that this works with any map from any texture slot. For example, for other materials like pattern glass with no diffuse map, I like to copy the map of the pattern and use it as the binding texture. Replacing materials. Here I have a scene with a white fabric on this chair, and it is also used in the multi-material for the sofa. And here's the new material that I want to use as a replacement. To use it, I will right-click, use as a replacement. Then select the material that I want to replace, and right-click, Replace in scene. As you can see, replace in scene will only replace the selected material where it is applied. Meanwhile, the sofa still has the old material as the reference. So to change this, right click the old material and select replace all references. This will replace the selected material in all places where it is used as a reference. So materials such as two sided or multi material will get replaced like so. Use glass material correctly. Here you can see I have four different squares, each of them are made into a group with a glass material applied to it. Now I will do a test render. As you can see, only the one on the right renders correctly, while the other three do not look like clear glass. 
If we zoom in closer, you can see that this first one doesn't have any thickness to it, so we know what's wrong with it. For the other ones, they all look the same. But if I turn on the monochrome style, then you will see that this one has a reverse face in the front. So to fix it, we can right click and reverse this face. It looks like the back is also reversed, so we need to flip that one as well. And there we go, that fixed it. This next one looks fine in the front, but it has a reverse face in the back, so we'll fix that too. As for this one, we just need to extrude it to give it thickness and that fixes that as well. There we go, when drawing glass, just make sure it has thickness and all of the faces have to point outward. Transparent background through window. Another problem related to glass material is that sometimes the background doesn't come out as transparent even when you save the image as PNG. So you can't add the background in post-production. To fix this, first I will select the glass material for the windows in my scene. In the VFB window, I will also use the drop-down menu to change to the alpha channel. Then let's expand the refraction settings. You might also need to click here to show the advanced settings. Now go down here in the effect channels and change it to effect color and alpha. As you can see, in the alpha channel, all of the windows are now changed to a dark gray or black color which indicates that these areas will be transparent when we export the render. If we change it back to color only, then you can see that they become white again. And that's how you fix it. Now you can export the image as a PNG or export the alpha channel and use it for post-production. If you want to learn more about how to add a background to your render, then check out this video. Avoid repetitive textures. Another mistake beginners often make is having repetitive textures. For example, here I have a cabinet door component which I will copy to create another one right next to it. However, you can see that since they are copies of each other, the textures are in the similar position so the objects look identical, which is not very realistic. And since they are instances of the same component, adjusting the textures in one component will affect the other as well. To solve this problem, you can right click and make one of them unique, then adjust the materials like so. As you can see, even though the change is subtle, it's still very important, especially when you have more copies of the same object. Reduce texture resolution. For example, here I have a wood material at two different resolutions, one at 1K and one at 4K. I will apply the 4K material to both the wall and the floor, then let's do a test render. As expected, you can see that the material looks really good. Now I will go back and apply the 1K materials to the wall and floor, then render it again. As you can see, the original image took 1 minute and 7.9 seconds to render, but the new one only took 38.5 seconds. However, the material on the floor looks really blurry and less quality. But if you look at the wall far away, you can see that the change in quality is not very noticeable. This is why it's a good idea to consider using high resolution maps only for materials that are up close, and for the rest of the materials in the scene, usually 1K to 2K resolution is good enough. Optimize materials color. One thing that not everyone knows about is that when a material is completely white, it will increase the render time. For example, here I have a kitchen scene with lots of white materials on the cabinets. You can see that the cabinet color is 100% white. Now I will make this white color a bit darker, not too much that is gray, but make it a bit off-white like so. You can see that the original scene with 100% white material rendered in 20 minutes and 16 seconds, but the second scene renders in 20 minutes and 5 seconds. Although it's a small improvement, this is even more useful if the scene is more complicated. Minimize displacement. When you have learned about displacement maps, you will often want to use it on every material because it makes the material look amazing. However, displacement maps often slow down your render a whole lot, so consider using displacement maps only when it's necessary, such as materials like bricks. But for materials like wood floor, stucco wall, etc., then bump maps are usually good enough. Editing Cosmos Assets Materials since update 1 of V-Ray 5, a new feature has been added to V-Ray called Chaos Cosmos, which is a library of 3D assets that you can use for free. These are render-ready assets which already have materials applied to them, so you can just drop them in and click render. As you can see, Chaos Cosmos is super convenient. Another cool thing about these assets is that you can change the materials of the objects if you like. To do that, first select the object and you will see it in the asset editor. Now click the right arrow to expand the right flyer panel to see more options. You can see that there's no options to adjust the materials here, so we need to click on merge. And now the object will be merged into the scene and you will see its materials have been imported. To edit one of these materials, click on this button and it will take you to the material settings. Here you can freely edit any of the maps. For example, 
You can wrap the diffuse map in a color correction texture to change the color of it. You can go to the materials tab to see all of the materials in the scene. And again, you can change them however you like. If you want to use a completely different material for the object, just import it to your scene. Here I'm importing a velvet material that we just created. Now go to the geometry tab and select the 3D asset. Then I can go down and click the leather material, then select the new material I just imported. There we go! Now you can take advantage of all of these amazing assets in KS Cosmos while having the option to customize their materials. The possibilities are endless. Contours. In Vray 5, you can easily add line works or contours to your scene with a single click. You can do that by going to settings in the asset editor and in the right flyer panel, scroll down to find contours and turn them on. You can see in the interactive render that the objects in our scene now have contour lines. There are several parameters that you can use to customize the contours, such as line color, opacity, width, etc. There are also other settings down here, such as no inner edges, which removes all of the inner edges of the objects and only keep the outer edges. You can also control the inner lines separately. To turn it on, you have to disable this option. The inner line control will allow you to control the color and the width of the inner lines. Alternatively, if you want to add contours to a specific material, then you can click here and add a contour attribute. Now you can use these settings down here to adjust the line work for this specific material. Here you will see the similar settings that you saw in the global contour settings. And note that these settings here will override the global contour settings. This is extremely useful for highlighting an object in your diagram. Another thing that you can do is to use a material override. This will give you a black and white diagram. Then you can also add some ambient occlusion if you like. If you want more emphasis on an object, you can select that object's material and go down here, then disable this option so that VRA doesn't override its material. As you can see, the new contour settings and material attributes are great for creating architectural diagrams. Dirt material. In VRA 5, the dirt material has been improved to have procedural streaks which makes it more realistic. Here I have a generic material applied to this object. I'll click here and add a dirt material. The dirt material is similar to ambient occlusion where you can adjust the radius and distribution amount. To make it easier to see in the render, I will add a diffuse render element and restart my render. Then in the drop down menu, I can select the diffuse channel and as you can see, it's a lot easier now to see how the dirt material is affecting my render. To add streaks to the dirt material, go down and enable streaks ambient. For it to work, we will need to adjust the direction bias. We want the streaks to go downward, so we need to increase the bias in the Z axis. There we go, now we can adjust the streak size however we like. After that, we can go back to the RGB channel to see the effect, and that looks good. For the next step, I will add a concrete material to the scene, then I will apply it to this object. Since this material already has a diffuse map, we need to wrap it in a mixed operator texture. So we can add a dirt texture on top of it. But since we already created a dirt texture in the other material, I can go back here and copy the dirt texture, then paste it here. Now we need to change the operator mode to multiply, and the dirt material will be overlaid on top of the concrete material. There we go, that looks good. And remember that you can always go back and make adjustments if you need. Pattern glass. Here I have a window with a typical glass material applied to it. Let's test render it. That looks good. Next, I will download a pattern for the glass. I will use this wavy pattern here, but you can use anything you like. Now I'll go back to the glass material, go down to refraction, then I'll click here to add a map to the refraction glossiness. You can see that the pattern is not rendering correctly, so let's go back 
and go down to Binding and change the texture mode to Custom. Now you can see the pattern on the rendering screen, but it doesn't show up in the SketchUp viewport. So let's go up here and copy the map that we imported earlier. Then we can paste it here in the slot. Now we can see it in the SketchUp viewport. And we can also change the size of the texture here. That looks pretty good. If the effect is too strong, then you can go to the map and go down to Color Manipulation and use the Color Offset slider to change the intensity. Alternatively, you can invert the texture like so. Pretty cool, huh? Now I'll go back and turn off the Refraction Glossiness map for now. Then I'll copy the texture and paste it in the Refraction Color slot. With some more adjustments, you can make it look like the pattern is colored glass instead of frosted glass. Let's zoom in closer to see it in detail. Here you can see that the black part is also reflective to make it pop a bit more. We can copy the same map that we've been using and paste it here in the reflection color slot. And you can also change the color here. Pretty cool, huh? As you can see, this is great for decorative glass such as this shower door here. Water on glass. First, I'll go to Polygon and download a water droplet material. You can go to the Surface Imperfections category and then select Water Droplets. Here they have lots of different materials, but you can download this one for free. After you download it, right-click and extract it to get access to all of the included maps. Now go back to SketchUp, and similar to the previous tip, I have the same starting model. Now in the Glass Material, I will go down to the Bump section, then click here and load in a bitmap file. I will select the normal map in the package. There are two versions, but I will choose the 16-bit one for higher quality. Then to make it render correctly, I need to change the color space to rendering space. And since this is a normal map, we need to change the map mode from bump map to normal map. It's quite hard to see the texture, so let's zoom in a bit. You can see that it's still really small. Similar to the previous tip, you can see that we cannot change the size of the texture. To fix it, you can copy the normal map, now go down to binding and change the texture mode to custom. Then we can paste the map here as an instance. Now we can see the map on the SketchUp viewport. You can also change the opacity in the SketchUp material tray to make it easier to see the texture. Now we can change the size of the map here. Also, if this effect is too much, then you can change the intensity here. And if you have a different map, like this rain streak texture, then you can load it in and re-render. Pretty cool, huh? As you can see, this type of material is great for rainy scenes with some rain streaks on a glass window. V-Ray Wrapper For the scene, I'll use an HDR image. So let's turn off the sunlight and add a dome light to the scene. Now I'll import an HDRI, then let's test render it. For this tip to work, we need to change from CPU render to QDA render. It's a bit too dark, so let's adjust the intensity to make it brighter. Also, change the shape to sphere so we can see the full HDRI. Now we can move around to see our environment. That looks good. Now let's place a car here. I will use the new KS Cosmos to add a car. Now we can move the camera or move the car to a good position where it fits the environment better. Instead of moving the camera, you can change the orientation of the HDRI by rotating the dome light. However, before you do that, you need to enable Use Transform. Now every time you rotate the dome light, the HDRI will rotate accordingly. Alternatively, you can always move and rotate the object however you want to make it fit the scene better. That's starting to look good. But as you can see, this is the problem when placing an object on top of an HDRI. The car seems to be floating because it has no shadows, but there's a way to fix it. Before we continue, let's save the camera view so we don't lose it later. Now I will use this button to lock the render camera view so we can move around without disrupting the view. Next, we will need to create a ground plane for the shadows to cast on. Also, let's reverse this face. Now let's go to the asset editor and create a wrapper material and apply this to the ground plane we just created. 
Next, we will need to change the alpha contribution to black alpha. Then turn on matte and enable shadows. We can see the shadows now, but we need to remove the ground plane. To do that, we need to change the settings. First, go to the HDRI and copy the map, then paste it in the background texture as an instance. You can see that the ground plane is removed, but this part looks super dark. So let's go back to the HDRI and change the intensity to 1. It looks dark, but we can change the brightness by adjusting the exposure value. As you can see, the V-Ray wrapper material will help create shadows on top of the HDRI and make your render look more realistic. Instead of using an HDRI, you can also use a flat image. To do that, you can go to Settings, Environment, and remove the current background image. Then I can insert a new bitmap image. You can see that it looks a bit odd, so we need to make some changes to the HDRI. If we turn it off completely, then we will lose the lighting. So I'll turn it back on and go to its settings and make the HDRI background invisible. Next, we need to go back to the new background image and go to texture placement to change the mapping to screen. There we go, that looks better. Now we can move the car to a position where it fits the scene better. As you can see, this method also works, but remember that you need to replicate the lighting condition as similar to the background image as possible. Thankfully, the previous HDRI that we used was good enough for the scene. The Vario Wrapper material is also great for creating mock-up materials like this. I will cover two different workflows for creating metallic materials. The first one is the specular or standard workflow using the generic material. And the second one is the metalness workflow using the new metallic material in V-Ray Next. First, I'm going to go to polygon.com and download a free metal material. I will leave the links in the description box below so you can download it and follow along with the tutorial. I'm going to choose this material here. If you click here, you can see the two workflows I mentioned earlier, specular and metalness. I will download both of these sets of maps at 3K resolution. After you have downloaded the maps, you can look at the names of the files to see what type of maps they are. With a quick look at the maps, you can see that the metalness workflow doesn't include the reflection and glossiness maps, but instead, it includes the metalness and roughness maps. Now, let's start with the specular workflow. First, create a generic material. Now, click here to open up the advanced parameters. Then let's start importing our maps. If you are new to creating materials, then watch this previous video, where I explain the functions of the basic texture maps. Now, let's load in the diffuse map by clicking this button here, and choose bitmap. From there, just select your diffuse or color map. Then I can use the pan bucket tool and apply the material to our model. The UV mapping is a little off, so to fix it, I can use one of these V-Ray UV tools here. Now I'm going to use the interactive render button to test render it. As you can see, it does not look anything like the preview from the website. So let's add another map. We will add the reflection map next. Similar to before, just click this button to add a bitmap and load in the reflection map. The reflection map is loaded, but it doesn't look very good. To fix it, click here to turn off for now. And boom, it looks better now. Next is glossiness. When loading this map, you need to change the color space from screen space to rendering space to have a more accurate material. Before loading the normal map, I'm going to zoom in a bit so you can see it easier. I'm also going to use the region render tool to only render half of the image so we can compare the before and after. Now let's go down here to bump and normal mapping and turn it on. Then click here to load in the normal map. This material came with two normal maps, a standard one and a 16-bit one, which is higher quality. I'll just use the standard one for now. For the normal map, you also need to change the color space to rendering space linear. And also, you need to change the map mode from bump map to normal map. Remember that if you're using the interactive render when loading a new map, sometimes you have to restart the render to make it look correct. Now you can start to see some details on the material. 
You can also change the intensity here if needed. This is probably too much, so I would change it back to 1. Finally, let's go down here and load in the displacement map. There are also two displacement maps. I'll load in the standard one. I'm going to restart the render to make it show up correctly. As you can see, the low quality displacement maps show some errors on the material. So I'll reload the map and use the higher quality 16 bitmap instead. There we go, that looks a lot better now. Now I can start adjusting the intensity of the displacement if needed. I'm going to zoom back out and change the displacement to 10 so you guys can see the effect of the map. That's too much, so I'll decrease it to 0.5 for a more subtle effect. Here's another cool trick. I want this material to be more glossy, so I'm going to go to my glossiness map, right click it, and choose wrap in. Then choose one of the two new curves material. I'll use the spline curve. Now I can adjust the material right inside of V-Ray and make the glossiness map brighter, so that the material is more reflective. There we go, pretty cool, huh? And that's how you can create metallic materials using the specular workflow. Now let's jump into the metalness workflow. First, create a metallic material. Note that this is only available for V-Ray Next. Then let's load in the maps. First is the color map. I will navigate to the metalness folder and load in the color map. I'll also apply it to my sphere and adjust the UV texture just like before. Next is the metalness map, which replaces the reflection map from the specular workflow. This map also uses the linear workflow, so you need to change the color space to linear. Then there is the roughness map. When importing this map, you also need to change the color space to rendering space linear. Again, sometimes you need to restart the render to have it show up correctly. Finally is the normal and displacement maps, which are the same as the previous workflow. So I will load them into this material just like before. Again, I can also go back and adjust any maps I like using the wrap in feature. I will use the Bezier curve this time. Since the roughness map is basically the invert of the glossiness map, I will need to make this map darker to make the material more glossy. How to correctly use displacement? If you have tried to use the displacement map before, but it doesn't show up in the render, then here's how you can fix it. First, make sure your material already has a displacement map. If you're not familiar with displacement map, then watch this video here. Next, select your surface and make it into a group. You can see that this group doesn't have any material yet. So let's select the same material that we've used for the surface and apply it to the group. You can see that it updated here. And soon after, it will update in the render as well. Now you can change the intensity of the displacement however you like. And that's one way of using displacement. If you have V-Ray 5, then you can use the new displacement geometry located in the V-Ray objects toolbar and apply it to the group. Then go to the geometry tab and click here to add a displacement map. Then you can change the amount here. Push and use materials. After working on a model for a while, your scene might have more materials in the file than what is being used. So remember to get rid of the unused materials to make your model lighter. An easy way to do that is by using the Purge Unused Material button. Just click here, and there we go. Light trails. First, let's draw a rectangle. I'll draw it vertically with a height of about 6 inches and make it quite long. This will represent the light trail. Now let's go to the V-Ray Asset Editor and create an emitter material. Next, click on the texture slot for the color and create a gradient texture. Here we can customize the gradient. Since we want the outside to have a color and the inside to have a different color, we need to add a color to the middle of the gradient by left clicking. Now I can change the color of each point like so. I'll add a red color to the outer colors and the inner color will be a lighter red or orange. Next, let's use the paint bucket tool and apply the material to the rectangle. Then let's test render. You can see that the texture is going the wrong direction, so we can change it here. There are other type of UV mapping for the gradient that you can try. I'll keep it simple for this one. 
that looks better. But we still need to resize the material to fit the rectangle, which was about 6 inches tall. Now let's change the sunlight settings so that it's nighttime where we can see the emissive material easier. That's looking better. And remember that you can always edit the material more if you like. For example, you can change the interpolation here to have different looks for the gradient. You can also add more colors to the gradient by left clicking. And if you right click, then you can remove it. I can use this method to make the red color more prominent. When you're happy with how it looks, let's go to the V-Ray frame buffer and open the left flyout panel, then go to the lens effects. And here we can turn on the bloom and glare. It doesn't seem like it's working even at the max size and intensity. So let's go back and increase the intensity of our emissive material. Then we can re-render and try again. That looks awesome. Now we can make it longer like so, and it looks even more like a light trail. Let's apply this method to our scene. If your scene has some curves like this row here, then you can first draw the path with the arc tool. And since a light trail is made by the cartel lights or headlights, there needs to be two of them in each lane. So I will use the offset tool to do that. Now we can select all of these lines and extrude them by vector using the extrude tool. Then you can apply the material to all of them and do a test render. That looks great. You can also add more light trails so that they don't look too uniform. Or you can even change the color of the light trails to be more red if you like. Pretty cool, huh? Lighting using sunlight. When using the V-Ray sunlight, the lighting will be affected by the SketchUp shadow settings. To change it, you can go to the shadows tray and set a specific time and date for your scene. If you want to manually adjust the sunlight without relying on the SketchUp shadow settings, then you can turn on custom orientation, which will allow you to manually adjust the sun's horizontal and vertical rotations with these sliders here. Next is the color and intensity. Here you can change the hue of the sunlight to a specific color that you want. For example, if you want a purple or a pink tint for a sunset scene, then you can change to a purple color. But remember, don't make it too intense, otherwise it will look unrealistic. For normal daytime renders, I usually leave it as a white color. Next is the color mode. By default, it is set to filter. If you change it to override, this will override the sun color with the selected color, which in this case will make it wider. Here's a comparison between the two modes. You can see a very subtle change, but the filter mode gives a warmer tone while the override mode gives a cooler tone. Next is intensity, which determines the power of the sunlight. You can use the slider to adjust the intensity or type in a specific value here. Or you can adjust the intensity over here as well. Next is the size multiplier. This will change the size of the sun, but what's more important is, the bigger the size of the sun, the softer the shadows. This is a great trick for controlling the shadow sharpness in your scene. Next is the sky model, which by default is set to Hosek. But if you want to do a sunrise or sunset render, then I suggest you change to the improved sky model. Here's a comparison between the two sky models. As you can see, the improved sky looks a lot more realistic during sunset. The V-Ray sunlight is the default way for lighting up your scene, but it lacks the background for the sky, so it'll always look a bit empty. However, in V-Ray 6, there is now an option to add procedure clouds to your scene. This is located in the sun settings. Go down to clouds, and click this toggle to enable it. As a bonus tip, when doing an interactive render, you can hide unnecessary objects in your model to make it run faster. For example, you can see I have organized different objects on different layers or tags, and since we are only focusing on the sky and the sunlight, I can just hide the unneeded objects and leave only the house visible. I also use V-Ray Fur for the grass, so I will turn that off as well. This will make our interactive render a lot faster. Continuing with the cloud settings, first is the density, which controls the amount of clouds. At the maximum value, it would be very cloudy. This is great for creating an overcast sky. Next is the variety slider, which controls the variety of the clouds in space and shape. The next slider is the series amount, which controls the amount of high altitude clouds. 
If you can't see the difference in the render, just use the eye tool and then look up. These clouds up high are the cirrus clouds. Next is the high slider, which controls how high the clouds are above the ground. Next, you can use this slider to make the clouds very thick or very thin. The next two sliders can be used to offset the clouds in the X and Y direction. Notice that whenever the clouds are moved, sometimes we lose the sunlight. That is because the clouds might block the sun like this. I really like this feature because it's really similar to real life. I do not want the sunlight to be blocked, so I will just reset the X and Y positions. Finally, the last setting is the ground shadows. When it's turned on, you will see the cloud shadows on the ground like so. You can see the shadows move as we adjust the position of the clouds too. I personally like this effect, so I will leave it turned on. There are many other settings, but these are only needed when doing an animation, so I will not cover these in this video. There we go, now I can unhide the VR4 grass and all the other objects in the scene. Then I can set the camera back to my main view. If the render is too dark, then you can change the advanced camera parameters to make it brighter. I have a video explaining all of these parameters, so if you want to learn more about them, then follow the link in the description box. If it's too bright and we lose the details in our sky, then we can add an exposure layer to our VA frame buffer window and adjust the slider so that it reduces the highlight burns like so. However, doing this too much will make the image lose details, so we can increase our exposure and contrast a bit to make it look more balanced. That looks good. Note that we can always go back and change the cloud density so that we can have a cloudy sky or a clear sky whenever we want. Also, you can change the cloud settings to quickly turn a daytime render to a sunset render. Since the clouds have volume, you can see that the colors from the sunset affect the clouds in a dynamic way. Instead of using the shadow settings, you can also give the sun a custom orientation by setting the horizontal and vertical angles here. Lighting using dome light Another way to light exterior scenes is to use dome light. To use the dome light, first we need to turn off the sunlight. Then on the lights toolbar, click on this icon and click on a spot in your model to add a dome light. You can now see that a dome light is added to the list. As you can see, a dome light is a light that surrounds your whole model with an image called High Dynamic Range Image or HDRI. This image is a panoramic image that also contains lighting information which helps eliminate the model. By default, various dome light already has an HDRI map but you can replace it with a custom map. To get custom HDRI maps, you can go to free HDRI websites such as Polyhaven or HDRI Haven. I will leave the links in the description box below as well. After you download your HDRI map, you can click on this button and load it in. As you can see, the rendering has been updated with a new HDRI but it seems a little dark. To make it brighter, you can increase the intensity here. There we go, that's better. Before I go to the next step to change the orientation of the HDRI, I will go to this view and click here to lock the camera so now I can freely move around without changing the render view. Next, let's change the orientation of the HDRI. We need to enable Use Transform. When enabled, this will lock the HDRI texture to the dome light so that when you rotate the dome light, the HDRI texture will also rotate. Another setting that you should keep in mind is the Shape option. If you've noticed, our HDR image has a ground, but it doesn't show up in the render. See how the bottom half of the HDR is not there? You can fix this by changing the shape from hemisphere to sphere like so. There we go, that's better. Now just apply these tips to add the dome light to your scene. The KS Cosmos library also has HDRIs that you can use. First, just download the one you want, then you will see it in the texture assets. Now you can right click and copy this texture then paste it in the texture slot of the dome light. Then we can adjust the intensity and rotation until it looks good. In some cases, the HDRI background looks good in one angle, but unfortunately the lighting that comes with the HDRI is not very fitting for the scene. In that case, 
you can combine the background of the HDRI and the lighting of the sunlight to make it look a lot better. To do that, first you will need to turn off every setting in the dome light and leave only the effects reflection parameter. Now only the background is visible, but the dome light doesn't affect the scene. Then we can turn the sunlight back on and make changes to it until we're happy with the results. The issue with dome lights is that sometimes the object can look like it's floating like this. However, in VR6, there's also a new option called Finite Dome, which if enabled, the dome light becomes a finite half dome with the ground. Here are the settings that you can use to adjust the size of the dome light. This is a process of trial and error because it depends on the HDR image. As you can see, with the finite dome option, the model is embedded into the HDRI. However, the problem is that the object in the render doesn't have any shadows. There's a trick to add the shadows to the car. First, add an infinite plane. Next, we need to create a generic material and make the diffuse color white. Then we need to create a wrapper material. Now I will select the infinite plane and apply the wrapper material to it. Then I will set the base color to the generic material that we just created earlier. And turn on matte. We also need to change this setting to a different option so that the reflection is fixed. Finally, we need to turn on shadows. And there we go, now we have a realistic model embedded in the HDRI. Lighting using LightGen On your V-Ray Light Toolbar, there's a button called LightGen or Light Generator, which is a V-Ray tool that automatically generates thumbnails of your SketchUp scene where each one presents a unique lighting scenario. After you launch it, you can choose either exterior or interior. And here you can set the altitude and azimuth variations. When you multiply these two values, you will get the number of variants. And finally, you can choose the thumbnail size. I'll leave it at the default value. When you're ready, click here to start generating the thumbnails. It will take a while depending on the number of variants and the speed of your computer. After it's done, you can see the thumbnails with the different lighting scenarios. When you click on one of them, the lighting will change accordingly and you can see that it updates in the lighting tab. Just choose whichever you like most and you're ready to render. For exterior, you also have the option to use HDR for lighting. Here you can choose the number of unique styles, variations, seed value, and the thumbnail size. The HDR option is super powerful as you can see, because V-Ray automatically creates a lot of realistic skies option for your scene. As you can see, the LightGen tool is a great way to quickly find the best lighting that fits your style without having to spend hours on test rendering. Also, there's an option to save the LightGen variations, so you can load them again later, which can save a lot of time. Pretty cool, huh? Sometimes I cannot find an HDR image that is a good fit for my scene. In that case, I can use a custom image as the background while using V-Ray sunlight to light my scene. First, let's import our background image. To do that, we can simply drag in the image like so. Now we can rotate, position, and scale it. However, you can see that it's not showing in the render. To fix this, we need to explode the image, then we can make it into a group again to keep our model organized. Now let's go back to our main view, then let's lock the render viewport using this button. This will allow us to move around in SketchUp while adjusting the background position without changing the position of the render window. I think that looks pretty good. However, you can see that the background is quite dark. To fix this, we need to sample this material and edit it in the viewer asset editor. I will change the preview mode to wall close-up to make it easier to see our background. Now click here and add an emissive layer. However, the material has turned into white so let's copy our diffuse map and paste it in the color texture slot of the emissive layer. There we go, now we can change the intensity to make it fit your scene. For this scene, I will leave the intensity at 1. And there we go, camera settings. Now that you know the different lighting techniques that you can use, let's talk about using camera settings. Sometimes the render can still be too dark or too bright. If that's the case, then go to the settings tab down in the camera rollout Use this slider to adjust the exposure value. And if you're familiar with real-world camera settings, then you can go to the advanced settings here to manually adjust the ISO, 
aperture, and shutter speed to change the brightness of the render. If you want to know more about these settings, then you can watch this video here. Alternatively, you can also let V-Ray adjust the camera exposure automatically by turning on this option here. However, for it to work, we need to stop the render and turn off the interactive mode. Now we can turn on the auto exposure option and do a test render. As you can see, V-Ray automatically adjusts the exposure for us. Also, after you have rendered with the auto exposure, you can click here to get the automatic values that we use. And if you click here, it will transfer the value to the exposure value here. Pretty cool, huh? This is extremely useful for new users. But for me, I personally like to use the advanced camera parameters here. V-Ray frame buffer. After your render is finished, you can use the V-Ray frame buffer to make some adjustments. For example, here you can see the lighting looks a little dark in these areas, but this area is a little too bright. To improve the lighting, I can double click here to open the right sidebar and here are my VFB layers. Now I'll click here and add an exposure layer. Then I can adjust the exposure using the slider or manually typing in a value here. As you can see, the scene is brighter now, but the highlight burn area just gets worse. If I go to View, Color Clamping, and click here to turn on Force Color Clamping, it will show me the areas that are too bright. Now I can fix this by decreasing the highlight burn until I can't see the clamp colors anymore. To compare the before and after, we need to turn off the Force Color Clamping setting. There we go, that looks a little better, but the image has lost some contrast, so you can increase it here. However, you can see that the render still lost some sharpness and details, that's why we're going to take it to Photoshop and do some final adjustments. Post-production in Photoshop. In Photoshop, I will double-click the image to turn it into a normal layer, then I will right-click and convert this into a smart object. Next, go up here and apply a camera raw filter, then I can use this to make some final adjustments, such as tweaking the exposure, contrast, etc., and more importantly, I'll use these sliders to bring back some sharpness and details. Up here, I can adjust the temperature and the tint of the image as well. The reason why I turned this into a smart object earlier is because now I can easily go back and make more adjustments if I need. Reduce poly count. The first thing to note is that the more polygons you have in your model, the longer it would take to render. In other words, the more complicated the scene, the slower the render speed. Here you can see I have two chair models, one has more polygons than the other. And when I render these chairs, the more complicated model took 38.2 seconds to render, and the more simplified model took 35.9 seconds. That's a 5% decrease in render time. This would make a bigger difference when you're dealing with larger projects. To reduce the number of polygons of existing objects, you can use Skim or Transmuter. I'll leave the links for those videos in the description box below. However, remember that whenever you reduce the poly count, the model will reduce in quality and its texture might get messed up. But if we are far away from the models, we cannot notice the difference. So when you're setting up the scene, consider using high poly count models when they're closer to the camera. And for objects that are farther away, you can just use lower quality models. Use proxies. If you do decide to have lots of complex objects in your scene, it's a good idea to use proxies. To do that, you can select the objects which you want to turn into proxies, then click this button, then just adjust the setting however you want and repeat this process for other objects which you want to turn into proxy. As you can see, the original render took 44 minutes and 41 seconds to render, and with the proxies, it reduced to 43 minutes and 54 seconds. This is not a huge improvement, but it still reduced the render time. And this is even more useful when you're dealing with bigger projects. Besides increasing the render speed, it will also make navigating around the model faster because it will reduce the sketch of file size. After converting objects to proxies, remember to remove the original components by going to the components tray, then click here, Purge Unused Components. This will remove the original models and only keep the proxies. Before I save the sketch of model, you can see the file size is about 122 megabytes. Now I can save it, and the new file size is 118 megabytes. And again, this is even more useful when you're working on bigger projects. If you want to learn more about proxies, I suggest you watch this video. Although it's a little outdated, it's still quite useful. Also consider using the Chaos Cosmo library, which provides high-quality proxy render-ready models. Optimize lighting. Here I have a view which renders in 44 minutes and 41 seconds. You can see that this part is a bit burnt, 
so I'll adjust the camera parameters to make it a bit darker, then re-render it. As you can see, this new image looks darker, but it's faster to render. That's because if the image is too bright, then the highlight burn areas can cause excessive render times. This is why it's important to optimize the lighting in your scene. And if the image is a little too dark, then you can always adjust the exposure in the VFB window after it's rendered. When I'm about to do the final production render, I usually increase the quality settings to high. With the high settings, this scene renders in 44 minutes and 41.9 seconds. However, when we set the quality to high, you can see that the noise limit is at 0.01, .01, which is the reason why the image looks quite smooth. However, the lower the noise limit, the slower the render. A trick that we can use to decrease the render time is to increase the noise limit. For this case, I'll increase it to 0.05. .05. But this will result in a lot of noise. So we will turn on the VRA do noiser. As for the settings, I'll keep it at default. And with the noise limit at 0.05 .05 and the denoiser turned on, it took only 9 minutes and 56.5 seconds. That's a huge improvement. But let's compare the two renders. From afar, you can see that the two renders look quite similar. But as we zoom up close, you can see that the right one has a lot more noise in the render. This is because the denoiser is still turned off. So let's turn off the comparison and double click on the second render. Now it looks smoother. And if we expand the right flyer panel, we can compare the denoiser when it's turned on and off. As you can see, the noise is completely gone. The 9 minute render now looks even smoother than the original render, which takes 44 minutes. However, a setback for this is sometimes the denoiser is too strong, which can make some parts of the scene lose details. So to fix this, you can adjust the opacity of the denoiser here. By decreasing the opacity, you will add some noise back in the render, but also bring back some details. Don't use depth of fill settings. When I want to create a depth of fill effect, I usually don't use a depth of fill settings in the camera tab. Instead, I will use a Z depth render element, which will allow you to create a depth of fill effect in post production. Here you can see that when I use a depth of fill effect, it takes 18 minutes and 31.4 seconds to render. But with the Z depth render element, it only takes 12 minutes and 45.6 seconds. Of course, you will have to spend more time in post production to create a depth of fill effect, but there are several benefits when using Z depth. One is that you will have the original image without the depth of fill effect. And with the Z-Depth Render element, you can control which area of the image you want to focus on. If you want to learn more about how to do this in details, I suggest you watch this video on how to use render elements. Pick and choose your render elements. Before you render, only add the render elements which you plan to use in post-production, because each one of them can add more time to your rendering process. Here you can see the one with lots of render elements took 24 minutes and 8 seconds to render, compared to 16 minutes for the one with no render elements. So for me, I usually add the previously mentioned Z depth. I also use the extra texture render element with a dirt map for ambient occlusion, and also other render elements such as material ID, diffuse, light mix, etc. Use Chaos Cloud. I've mentioned Chaos Cloud before in this video. It's basically a cloud rendering service made by Chaos Group, the developer of V-Ray. To use it, you can set up your scene for final production render as usual, then click this drop down button and click on the cloud render button, which is also available on the V-Ray toolbar. Next, you should see a web page open where you can submit the render. And here's where you can keep track of the render's progress. Now you can wait for the render, but in the meantime, you can still use your computer to work on your project. Once it's done, you can see the information for it on the right side, such as the amount of credits spent and the render time, which in this case is 27 minutes and 42 seconds. This is a huge improvement compared to when I rendered with my PC, which took 44 minutes and 41.9 seconds. That's about a 40% decrease in render time, which is amazing. And if you're happy with the render, you can download it here. The cool thing is that if you have a scene with multiple views, you can render them all with Chaos Cloud. If you click on the Batch Render button, V-Ray will upload all of the views in your scene at once. As you can see, Chaos Cloud is not only really fast, but you can also render multiple images at once. And in the meantime, you can still use your computer to continue working. This has been the greatest game changer for me. So if you want to try it out, you can use this link and sign up for 20 free credits to test your render. In the real world, it's rare to see an object perfectly clean or a room perfectly organized. However, in computer graphics, we get the straight lines and clean objects by default, so when your render is too perfect, people will definitely know that it's a 3D model. That is why it's a good idea to add some round corners to the edges of your objects, and when decorating the scene, give the objects a little twist and turn, and move it slightly so that they're not perfectly aligned. For example, I usually like to rotate and flip similar components such as these chairs here. 
Sometimes I like to go even further, like adding some hardware to these drawers just so I can pull them out and make it look even more interesting. As you can see, this method will give the scene more personality, making it more realistic. Even when you have a good model, but if you don't set up the camera correctly, then your render can still look bad. So here are a couple of tips to improve your composition. One is to adjust the field of view so that it's not too wide or too narrow. If the field of view is too wide, then it will look distorted. To adjust the field of view, press Z for the zoom tool and you will see in the bottom right corner the current field of view. It's around 75 degree right now, so I can change it by typing 5, 0, then enter to change it to a more realistic field of view of 50 degrees. Now I can left click and drag down to zoom out a bit and make sure you save the view after you make changes. Here is the comparison between the two views. You can see the second one looks a lot more realistic. Another tip is to use two-point perspective so that the camera is not tilted. Sometimes I see people tilt the camera slightly up or down like so. When you do this, the vertical lines will become slanted, which is not great for the composition. So to make it look better, go to camera and select two-point perspective. This will fix the slanted verticals and make your composition look a lot better. However, sometimes it's okay to have slanted vertical lines. For example, if you're doing a view from the top like this, then I actually recommend you to not use two points perspective. Note that you can try different aspect ratios too. For example, here I have a scene with a landscape aspect ratio at 35 degree field of view, but I can change the aspect ratio to portrait by first going to the very settings. Under render output, I will turn on the save frame so you can see the render region. Then I can click here and change the aspect ratio to portrait. When you do this, the view will look a little distorted, even though it might not look like the field of view has changed. But if you reselect the zoom tool, it will show the true field of view. Now I can readjust it, and I can change the image width and height if I need. Another common mistake beginners make is using 3D people in their render. Even though these are high quality and can be called realistic, but they're still not realistic enough. So if you take a really good model and insert 3D people into it, this is an automatic giveaway that is a render instead of a real photo. It's because 3D people will look better from far away, but they are not very realistic up close. Personally, I still don't like to add people in my render, sometimes it's just better without them. A good model with good materials can still look bad if it has bad lighting. For nighttime renders, it's important that you use the correct light assets for different light fixtures. For example, I often use the spotlights for recess lights, the rectangle or plane lights are good for lights with rectangular shapes such as surface mount lights or these under cabinet lights here. The sphere lights are good for pendants and lamps. Mesh lights are useful for lights that have irregular shapes such as the light bulb itself or this LED lighting behind my logo here. 